Welcome back. In this brief video, we're going to take a peek inside the box of a typical PC to see what's in there. Our textbook mainly focuses on three things, the instruction set architecture, the CPU, and memory. These are the most important components, but other components deserve a few minutes of our time as well. The motherboard is the main circuit board that connects everything together. The motherboard facilitates communication between all the components. It's going to contain a socket for the CPU and connectors for memory and other hardware. Motherboards come in different form factors, for example the ATX. The CPU, the central processing unit, is the most important component. It's the brains of a computer system. The CPU executes the machine language instructions. Modern CPUs are going to be multi-core CPUs using multi-threading that can perform at least two execution threads per core. And clock speeds typically range from 3 to about 5 gigahertz. Different components inside a computer system need different voltages. A power supply will take the input voltage from the wall and output many different voltages to the different components. When selecting power supplies if you're building your own computer, quality and safety matter. High-end gaming computers may need specialized power supply. RAM, random access memory, plugs into the motherboard. The CPU has internal memory, but it's limited in size. RAM serves as the auxiliary memory, and memory is swapped between the CPU and RAM as needed. When buying a computer, you should buy as much RAM as you can. More RAM means faster processing and overall better performance. RAM is volatile memory. It loses its contents upon loss of power. Most PCs will have one or more internal drives for hard disks, CD, or DVDs. These are non-volatile memory devices. They keep their contents upon power loss. The two main types of hard disk are the magnetic disk and solid state drives. We'll discuss these in more detail when we get to the memory chapter. Hard disks have evolved many different connection interfaces. Here are some of the most common interfaces. The IDE connects to a motherboard with ribbon cables that you may see if you look inside your PC. SATA is an interface for connecting a solid state drive to the PC. An SCSI, pronounced SCSI, interface is usually for high-performance drives. Fireware connection is for high-speed data transfer, for example, audio and video. And the USB Universal Serial Bus is for communication with devices. USB keeps evolving as well. Here are many different USB forms. Here are some additional interface standards for I.O. connections. PCI allows for anywhere from 1 to 32 lanes for I.O. devices. There used to be separate chips on the motherboard connecting microprocessor to memory and I.O. devices. But more recently, these connections are internal to a chip such as Intel Sandy Bridge. Most modern PCs and laptops will have a GPU, a graphics processor, as well as a CPU. These originally were for graphics in gaming systems, but more recently have become useful for high-performance computing and machine learning. On the right we see inside a PC. There's a lot of empty space in there. On the left we see inside a laptop. It's a lot more crowded in there. The term software can be broken down into application software or system software like the operating system. The operating system is like an interface between the CPU, the user, and the actual hardware. Applications must compile for a specific operating system. When we get to the memory chapter, we'll talk about the memory hierarchy, how there are different types of memories across a computer system. Memory management is a complicated process. It requires swapping memory from disk to RAM and from RAM to internal CPU cache memory, coordinating which processes get which memory blocks. This is a shared task between the hardware, the operating system, the CPU, and applications. Here are many connectors you might see on your computers. How does a computer system handle I.O.? Different approaches have evolved over decades of computing. The simplest approach is polling. The CPU 
pulse devices to see if they need attention. This actually takes up too much of the CPU's time. An interrupt-based approach will just interrupt the CPU whenever an I.O. device needs attention. DMA direct memory access, these devices have permission to read and write to RAM and don't have to involve the CPU in that process. Memory mapped I.O. reserves portions of the address space for I.O. devices and then the communication to the device is over some protocol and can be as simply as writing to and reading from memory. On the motherboard, a PC's chipset manages communication between the CPU, RAM, storage devices, and peripherals. This diagram shows a chipset with two parts. The north bridge contains the memory controller and is connected to the CPUs via the front side bus. The south bridge handles communication with other devices. One bottleneck that can occur is when devices must communicate with RAM through the CPU. The north bridge eliminates this bottleneck by handling this access without the CPU involvement. Another bottleneck is the bus from RAM to north bridge. Many devices now have direct memory access, but the CPU is now competing with DMA requests for RAM. CPU cores and threads may have to wait for access. A workaround is to connect Northbridge to many external memory controllers. Beginning with AMD64 and the Intel Nehalem, the memory controller was moved inside the CPU die. Starting with Sandy Bridge, all of the Northbridge functionality moved inside the CPU, which makes it much faster. In this configuration, CPUs have local RAM for each core but each core can access all memory. So the memory access time is now no longer uniform. This is called NUMA or non-uniform memory architecture. This 10 gigabit ethernet card can connect up to four links. So any computer connected to a network needs a NIC network interface card. Every NIC has a hardware media access control address that is written into that NIC when it's manufactured. In contrast, IP addresses are associated with network software. Information is set over networks in packets, bundles of data and control information such as source and destination network addresses, air detection codes, and so forth. There are a lot of steps involved in packing and unpacking, sending and receiving packets. To transfer a packet, the driver has to prepare a packet buffer in memory copies a packet from the user address space to the buffer, writes the I.O. descriptors, and copies the outgoing Ethernet packet from the buffer over PCIe. When transmission is complete, the DMA interrupts the processor with notification of successful transmission, and the driver deallocates the transmit buffer. A process somewhat in reverse happens on the receiving end. Most of the time we don't open up our PCs, much less a laptop. Years ago, people used to open up the box to do a lot of things like add more RAM and upgrade components. In the past several years, computers have become cheaper so that it's often worth it from a financial point of view to just replace your computer every two to three years. An exception to everything I just said might be this Intel Z390 gaming desktop. In this video, we looked a little at anatomy of a PC, how all the components come together and how interfaces define how they work together. In the next part of the course, we focus on the CPU and memory, the most important components in any computer. Throughout this video, I've sprinkled around a lot of terminology like seeds in a field. Don't expect all of these terms to take root and grow. The idea is just to provide an overview of the language of hardware and interfaces, which is something we don't often encounter in computer science courses. Mm -hmm.